Welcome to Rugged Cross Ministries. I'm your host, Greg Rugged Cross Chapel. Uh, today we're going to look at uh, forgiveness. Um, and we're going to do that by way of looking at who Paul was. And looking at who Paul was is going to give us a couple examples of what uh, true Christian forgiveness should look like. A um, couple, of, couple of quick announcements. Um, one being... Um, an issue with the uh, timing of this broadcast. Um, for those of you that are listening in on uh, a podcast or watching our YouTube video, um, th this message was intended to go out uh, yesterday, which would have been 7 6 of 22. Um, kind of got to explain the process for you to understand why this delay happened um, I usually do a live stream directly on our our Facebook home page and then uh, convert that master file to the file types required for the various platforms that we are on um, so with that said um, I did attempt to do this broadcast yesterday, and we had an issue with the audio. Um, for some reason, I was getting audio here in my headset, but it wasn't broadcasting. Um, obviously, I've gotten that issue fixed. Um, so for the benefit of the, our podcast listeners and our YouTube viewers, um, that is the reason for the delay. We had a, a technical difficulty with the audio. Um, being as how we do one master recording um, that kind of delayed all of them. Um, another couple other quick announcements. Um, we had a prayer request that although the uh, broadcast didn't go out, the, the prayer request did go out and um, we kind of have a praise or report to go with each of those. Um, one of those prayer requests was a co-worker of my wife. His, uh, his wife was about to give birth. So, of course, we were, we were praying that everything went well and properly. And both mom and baby came out uh, healthy. Um, we received word last night that... The baby was born and was healthy, and mom's doing good too. Um, we also had another prayer request from one of our prayer group members who wishes to remain anonymous. Um, we do need to continue this prayer request. Um, she's asking for uh, some financial aid. Um, she's in a pretty tough spot, and. Uh, kind of requires some financial assistance to get out of it. Um, there is a praise that goes along with that. Um, I received word, I believe it was this morning, it may have been overnight, that uh, at least one of those financial issues is working out, um, but we, we do need to continue to pray for that situation for her. Um, I also mentioned that... Uh, I've decided to add a little bit of credibility to this ministry and I've gone through the uh, the quick process of getting uh, ordination through my state and uh, did some research and found a uh, seminary that provides courses uh, through the financial assistance of their supporters. Uh, so I'll be looking into uh, those courses and probably taking some of those courses. So, you know, that was a prayer request there that everything works out to be as good as it looks and I'm able to uh, get those various certifications that they offer. Um, it is an accredited school. Um, 
for two reasons. I'm not going to mention the school just yet. Uh, for one, I don't like to do endorsements in conjunction with a message. And two, I haven't actually checked it out yet. Um, I did, you know, sign up and get registered and all that stuff, but I haven't actually checked it out. Um, I do know that I'll have to uh, be cautious, I guess is the word I should, I'm should. i looking for, of uh, doctrine. Um it's not a doctrine specific seminary so i have to be cautious of doctrine but i think the uh, overall teachings and lessons will be helpful um, and so with that said uh, let's just uh, go into our prayer and get into our message um, dear god we once again bring the praise and prayers to you that were mentioned yesterday but not heard by our listeners and viewers. We ask that you remain with the uh, financial situation, help that to work out however it needs to work out. And we thank you for the healthy birth of uh, my wife's co-worker's child and I ask that you guide me through these seminary courses that you've helped me find and above all I ask that I not just speak my words in today's message, I ask that my words be your words. I ask that our listeners and viewers not only hear my words, but your words. Ultimately, this shouldn't be my message, it should be yours. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so getting into it, we're going to look at who paul was excuse me while i get this echo out of my ear we're going to look at who paul was in order to have a uh, overall context for our next message about uh setting a good christian example um so we have to we have to understand that there are a few I'll say misinformed misconceptions about who Paul was and how he came to be known as Paul. Uh, Paul originally started out um, as Saul the persecutor and uh, Saul was as quoted by my source a Pharisee among Pharisees so he, he was very influential and he was a major contributor to the persecution and attempts at blocking and even eradicating uh, what then was known as the way, excuse me, uh, we now call it Christianity. So Paul was a major player, Saul, sorry, Saul was a major player in trying to stop Christianity from being what it is today. And so Saul and Paul were one and the same. If uh, 
if you take Paul to its, you take the name Paul to its definition as a name, Paul means little salt. So, in all actuality, Saul did not change his name to Paul. He just took on a, a different connotation of the same name. Um, and there, there's, there, there's a misconception that Saul changed his name. Excuse me. Jesus changed Saul's name on the Damascus Road. And that is also, like I said, a misconception that happened well after his encounter on the Damascus Road. Um, and somehow, some people get the misconception, even I had that mis this misconception that... Saul had an actual physical interaction with Jesus on the Damascus Road. Uh, we'll get, Paul actually tells us that this was not a physical interaction. It was a revelation. And we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. But uh, just know that Saul was very influential and very well known as a persecutor of Christians. So, uh, look at uh, Acts chapter 9. And just so I don't have to keep saying it every time. Uh, these are going to be scriptures out of the NIV translation. I did cross-reference with King James, which I normally do. Um, NIV is just easier for me personally to read and comprehend. So with that said, all of our verses will be at NIV. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 9. Uh, make sure I'm actually looking at all that. We're going to start out uh, I gotta find it. Make sure I'm reading. Yeah, we're gonna look at uh, verses one through 19 in Acts chapter 9. And it, it's, it's talking about Saul's conversion. And uh, since we're not going into the context of chapter 8, or I should say the chapters prior to chapter 9, I'm going to paraphrase the first word just a little bit. So starting in verse 9, excuse me, starting in verse 1, Acts chapter 9 says, As Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Uh, again, the way is what we now know as Christianity. Uh, it was just kind of a basic term that they generically used to uh, identify the, the, the Christian movement, the, the development of Christianity. But uh, so at this point, Saul is still actively involved in the persecution of Christians. 
we we'll continue on in verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, a light from heaven flashed around him. Notice it says a light. It doesn't say he saw Jesus walk up to him. A light flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute, persecute me? Again, he heard a voice. He didn't physically see Jesus. He heard a voice. But he, he knew that this was someone with more power than him. Because Saul's response was, Who are you, Lord? And, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Okay, so now we've established he did have an interaction with Jesus. But we've also established it wasn't a physical interaction with Jesus. And this is also verified by the men that were traveling with Saul. We continue on in verse 7. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. More evidence that this was not a physical interaction. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. We can infer from this that uh, the light was beyond the capabilities of human vision and caused him to go blind. Which we can also infer was a message, uh, an affliction to, as a means to an end. <laughs> For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So not only did this interaction cause Saul to be blindness, it also caused him to fast for three days. Now verse 10, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Again, in a vision. Now the, the, we got to understand here that the reason it's, all these things are happening in a vision. It's because the entire book of Acts takes place after Jesus ascended to heaven. So, the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. So now Jesus is t talking to Ananias and still referring to Saul as Paul. Th this lets us know that Jesus didn't change Saul's name when he interacted with Saul. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. <clears throat> now, Ananias knows what's up with, with, with Saul. He says, verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he, he has come here with the authority from the chiefs to arrest all who call on your name. So Ananias knows that Saul is not friendly when it comes to the Christians. Ananias knows that Saul is a major part of their persecution. But listen to what the Lord says in verse 15. But the Lord said, said to Ananias, Go, this is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles 
and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. So Jesus tells Ananias, and we're, we're assuming it's Jesus. It may have been God, but we're assuming it's Jesus. Tells Ananias, look, I know your concerns, but I intend to use this man for my work. It's not up to you to punish him for his past. Any suffering he must go through, I will cause it. Moving on with verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. Now what he says here is our, our first example of what true Christian forgiveness should look like. Just listen to how he addresses Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Two things just happened here. For First off, Ananias, even with his reservations about going to Saul, addressed him as brother. And then he immediately confirms that he also had an interaction with Jesus. So, we were assuming up to this point that it was Jesus, and Ananias has confirmed it. But, that's, that's one example of forgiveness, you know. Jesus told Ananias, look, I'm going to use this man. I don't care about his past. I'm going to use this man. And with that knowledge, Ananias addresses Saul as brother. Again, still addressing him as Saul. Verse 18. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So... The, the fact that something that resembled scales fell from Saul's eyes kind of clues us in to it was his blindness and fasting was a result of his interaction with, with Jesus. Okay. So we're going to take a look at Galatians chapter 1. Uh, this is Paul writing a letter to the churches in Galatia. Uh, he's, at this point, he's given his uh, opening blessings and introduced what he's going to talk about uh, and he's he, he's addressing that there's no other gospel than God's gospel okay and we're going to start with verse 10 and we may skip around a little bit but we're going to start with verse 10 Galatians chapter 1 Paul says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Hasn't really admitted anything yet, but he's cluing us in that before he became a servant of Christ, he was trying to please the people, not God. In verse 11, he, he goes on, he continues on. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So the, the, right there, the end of verse 12, is where Paul tells us that his interaction with, with Jesus wasn't a physical interaction it was a revelation it was it was a vision 
It was it was a spiritual moment. It wasn't a physical moment. Now in verse thirteen, he's gonna he's gonna start telling us that he he was Paul was Saul. For you have heard of my previous way of life in in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my of my fathers so he tells us that he was influential in Judaism and he was involved in the persecution of the church of God and he even tried to destroy it Paul himself is telling this And then he tells us of the conversion in verse 15. But, but when God who, sent me apart, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. So he tells us, you know, God, God showed himself to me. He showed me he showed me Jesus and and enlightened me in in the fact that uh, what I was fighting against was real. And rather than going back to the Pharisees and going back to Jerusalem and seeking their their advice, he just went on and started doing what God wanted him to do. So he says, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. Okay. And then three years later, this is, this is verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas. And stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles. Only James the Lord's brother. I assure you before God. That what I am writing to you. Is no lie. So he's already. Already. Been. Traveling around. And, and preaching God's word. And the only person associated with with Jesus that he spoke to, the only person that he has sought counsel from, is Jesus' own brother, James. And, and we say that to get to... when... His name actually changed to Paul. Okay. So we go to Acts chapter 13. This one we're going to skip around quite a bit on. Uh, verse 1. And we got we got to start here so we understand the context of the rest. So we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Now in the church at Antioch there were there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, don't know if I pronounced it right, who had been brought up with Herod to Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I, to which I have called them. So, when we get into verse 4, now we know that the two are Barnabas and Saul. And they're on... In verse 4, they're on Cyprus. 
and I'll probably get some of these names wrong. Um, so verse 4. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. That's important to let us know that the, it wasn't just Barnabas and Saul. John was also there. <clears throat> and by the way, this is Luke telling us, telling us these things. Uh, let's see. Okay. Verse 6. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Are you catching on that we're still... Saul's out doing God's work. Saul's out preaching. But we're still referring to him as Saul. And then we get to verse 9, and we get our first indication that Saul is Paul. And we've got to remember, this is just another connotation of the name Saul. Because Paul means little Saul. Luke says in verse 9, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimias, and said, You are the child of the devil and the enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? I went ahead and went into what still Saul at this point said just to finish the, the train of thought there. And we skip on down to verse 13, and we see our first reference that Saul has now become Paul. In verse 13, it says, excuse me, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. So, in verse 13 of Acts 13 is where we get our first reference to Saul actually being named Paul. I mean, back in verse 9, we're introduced to the idea that Saul and Paul are one and the same. And in verse 13, we no longer hear about Saul, he becomes Paul. I just not. I lost track of the same scripture yesterday. I don't know where I lost track of it, but. I know what I did. I did the same thing yesterday doing this. I got out of the verses that were going to show me exactly what I wanted. Okay.
in the world. Okay. I can't believe I lost track of this again. Just look it up right quick. Okay. It's, it's Acts chapter 9. Why my previous reference cut off where it did. Going into... Verse 26 of Acts chapter 9. Again, I don't know why my other reference ended at 19. We're, we're get, getting back to uh, when Paul or Saul um, joined with the disciples and the apostles. Or apostles, depending on how you want to say it. Um and we're also going to find out why it was important that Barnabas was with Saul when he was sent out. Um, so Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Uh, again, this is Luke telling, telling us the story. And he's talking about Saul. At this point, he's still Saul. Because we've gone back to chapter 9. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. So, when, when Saul first approached the disciples, may have been to seek counsel or to travel with them or both, we're not actually given that in the scripture here. They they were they had the same reservations Ananias had you know they knew his reputation and they weren't convinced that he had uh, he had changed. But, but in verse twenty seven, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. This is why it's important to point out that when he started his ministry, Barnabas was with him. Barnabas was the one that got him into the, the 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 group, you know, got got him joined up with the apostles. So we go back to the beginning of verse twenty-seven. But Barnabas took took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord. And that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So, Barnabas had either heard or witnessed. Again, it doesn't tell us exactly how Barnabas knows this. That there had been a change in Saul, and Saul was preaching fearlessly in the name of Jesus said Paul, we're, we're talking about when he was still known as Saul. But, like I said, the apostles had these reservations. But after, after Barnabas, Barnabas 
vouches for Saul. Verse 28. So Saul stayed with them and moved about them freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. So, we've got an example of the apostles displaying true forgiveness. They, they knew who Saul was, and they knew the things Saul was guilty of. And Saul had been out, you know, after his revelation and healing, Saul had been out preaching fearlessly, it says, in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus. And somehow, by the time Saul wanted to join the apostles, Barnabas had, had caught wind of this news. And Barnabas vouched for him. So the apostles took him in and began, began to train him and allow him to do what God wanted him to do among them. And I think that that is a prime example of what true forgiveness should look like. Saul had Saul had a past that was just totally detrimental and totally against the Word of God, but he he changed he changed his way of life and. God started using him. And the apostles saw this, and they took him into their group. But they forgave him. And I think they still had a few reservations because they didn't immediately say, let's call him Paul. That, that took some time. I mean, we just uh, it, they don't start calling him Paul until chapter 13. So there, there was still some time in there where they were kind of feeling him out and, and making sure he was who, now at this point, Barnabas claimed he was. But he, they, st they still took him in, they gave him a chance. And then as a further act of forgiveness, they, they, the apostles had uh, a time where they, they, they sought counsel from the Lord. And it's not really given to us what the outcome of that counsel was. But we do know by this point, it's not a direct divine intervention that changed Saul's name to Paul. Not saying it wasn't a divine intervention, but it wasn't direct. God nor Jesus came to Saul and said, "You will now be known as Paul." That's what I mean by it wasn't a direct divine intervention. Rather, Luke got the idea, or was told directly to change Saul's name to Paul, which again means little Saul during that time of counsel we don't know but Luke slowly starts introducing us to the idea and I think what's going on in, in Luke's mind rather it be his own thoughts or, or uh, uh, we'll use the word revelation again from, from God that this needed to happen. I think what's going on in Saul's mind, excuse me, in Luke's mind, is up to now, everybody knows Saul. Everybody knows what Saul stood for, what Saul was guilty of. And now Saul's, Saul has changed. He, he's come to the way of the Lord. He's come to the way of Christ. And he, he's preaching in the, in the name of the Lord. But we got a problem here. 
people know these things about Saul. So Saul is going to face far more opposition than he should just by association between his name and his history. So I think maybe Luke got the idea in his head, hey, hey Saul, if we call you Paul, which is another connotation of your name, that's going to take away that prejudice to an extent and, and help you move forward in your, your missions and your work for God. And so, you know, I, I see this as a, as a further act of forgiveness. Saul couldn't go out and preach the word of God and have people listen to him and take him seriously. But little Saul, Paul, could. So, in a sense, by his name changing from its original connotation of Saul to another connotation being Paul, they've kind of they've kind of done the same thing for him that Je that Jesus did. You know, Jesus forgave his history, wiped it away, started using him by changing Saul's name to another connotation and changing his name to Paul. The apostles have done the same thing. They've already forgiven him. And in a sense, by changing his name, they've erased his past. Because the people he meets now are going to know him as Paul. And they're not going to associate that with the history of Saul. So, that's how Saul, the persecutor, became Paul, the apostle. It wasn't really a name change, as, as some people view it. It sounds like a name change. Saul, Paul, sounds like a name change. But really, Paul is just another connotation of Saul. So the, his name really wasn't changed. The association between his name and his past was changed. By changing that association from Saul to Paul, they created a non-existent history. Whereas Paul could go out into the world as a follower of Christ, doing Christ's work with little more opposition than the apostles from the beginning faced. On the other hand, Saul would have had a hard time going out into the world as an apostle, doing God's work, with the association of his past as a persecutor of, G of God and his work. Or not necessarily like God, I'm saying that wrong. As a persecutor of Jesus and his work. Because again, Saul was Jewish. Paul says so itself. Saul was Jewish. So it's not that he was persecuting God or God's work. He was among those who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, is what it basically boils down to. And someone that doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah in that world where word of mouth and messengers gets around faster than you do. 
it's kind of hard for a person for someone that doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah to suddenly believe that Jesus is the Messiah and start preaching in the name of Jesus. So the apostles took that away from him. The apostle says, "No, this is this is not going to work if the people still associate you with your past." So we're going to start calling you Paul, which is just another connotation of your name. And that, in a sense, is going to erase the history of Saul and allow you to continue on as a servant of the Lord as Paul. So I, I ask you, many of us are able to forgive. You know, somebody somebody does us wrong or someone offends us, we're able to say, eh, whatever. We may decide not to associate with them anymore, but we're, we're able to put that behind us. In this instance, we're talking about a man who wanted to end the legacy of Jesus. And... Obviously, Jesus knew, and the apostles knew, yet Jesus forgave him and decided to use him and wiped all that away in the spiritual sense. And then he goes to the apostles, and he proves himself to the apostles, and the apostles forgive him. And then they realize that among men, his past was going to stand in his way. So in a sense, by changing the connotation from Saul to Paul, they did the same thing Jesus did. They wiped that past away. So my question is to you, are you, better yet, not even a question, the, the mission for us as Christians when it comes to the newly converted and those that Jesus wants to, Jesus and our God wants to use, are you and me as Christians, are we able to forgive in a Christ-like way like the apostles did? Are we able to say, okay, well, I know your past, but that doesn't matter. God wants to use you. Let me help you. Let me help God use you. Are we as Christians doing that? We're capable of it. Are we doing it? I know myself, many, many churches I've been in, wouldn't even give me a chance to prove that my life changed from these days to where I'm at now. I found one church where the pastor was willing to take me on, basically as an apprentice, and start the traditional ordination process. Matter of fact, as far as he's concerned, he did ordain me. But it, it, it never really was made official. And now in the church I'm in now, they're allowing me to serve on the AV team. They allow me to volunteer for events. They allow me to serve at those events. Um, there's been a couple of, there was one event where I put on a bicycle show because I like to build custom bicycles. There's been a couple of events where our normal DJ wasn't able to make it, and I packed up my equipment, and I did the DJ in. I'm in a church now that there are some blockades through church policy, but I'm in a church now that it doesn't matter what your past is. There's some things that your past kind of stand in your way, but it doesn't matter what your past is. For the most part, they're going to let God use you. 
but it's been my experience there's not very many churches like that and it's very very disheartening even if it's the church that's controlling it it's very disheartening to know that the people are allowing the church to treat people that way so we as christians we as the servants of god we as the sheep that god has set a shepherd over to guide us need to start displaying that forgiveness that the apostles and jesus displayed for saul if a man that, that was so against jesus as saul can be forgiven by jesus and the apostles in the beginning of christianity why can't someone who's had a torrid past now and probably not involved in the types of things that Saul was involved in be forgiven in the same way if the churches I started out in had been as forgiving as that, that pastor and this church and pastor that I'm with now I wouldn't still be developing my ministry with God. I wouldn't still be developing this ministry right here in front of you. It would already be developed. Who knows? I may may have even already been leading my own church if that's what God wanted. But there's been roadblocks in the way. And I've only found a couple of narrow passageways in those roadblocks. And we need to we need when it comes to serving the Lord Whatever your past is, whatever a person's past is, when it comes to serving the Lord, we don't need to just open up those roadblocks and open up those passages a little wider. We need to do what Jesus did. We need to do what the apostles did. We need to eliminate those roadblocks. I got to land this plane. I could stay up here on this pedestal all day. I got to land this plane. So we just going to crash land it. Let's go ahead and go into prayer. <coughs> Dear God, I pray that those that have heard and reviewed this message, heard your message from it. I pray that you were able to speak to them through it. And I ask that you give us all the strength and courage to forgive in the ways that you forgive and open up, allow the doors that you open to swing wide open. Give us the courage to accept anyone you send to us to expand your kingdom. But give us the discernment to know the difference between those you sent to us and those who just want us to think you sent them to us. Give us the wisdom to do it in a way that shows discernment and not prejudice. And be with us and guide us and protect us until we meet again here through this ministry or with our local home churches if we have them. And I pray a special blessing on those who are viewing or listening. That you just bless them in the ways that they need blessed. In your name we pray. Amen. So this weekend, we're going to look at a message that's going to be titled, Are Your Eyes Upon Jesus the Way Your Children's Eyes Are Upon You? With this, we're going to look at how we unknowingly set an example for our children. 
which also demonstrates how we unknowingly set an example for the world. Our children are not the only ones watching us. We consciously try to be careful what we're portraying to our children. But the world is watching us too, and we tend to forget that. So this weekend, we're going to look at how to be a good example of a Christian to the world through how we set an example for our children.